let's start with the only Teen Wolf God that seems to actually still be active in the present day in Beacon Hills. That would be Odin, the father of Thor and head honcho in the Norse pantheon. We see proof of his existence indirectly with the Wild Hunt. Odin is a nasty bit of work, mean-tempered and bloodthirsty. He started the Wild Hunt way back in the deep dark before. Throughout history, the Ghost Riders sweep through the sky, riding a supernatural storm and collecting souls as they go. They got stuck in Beacon Hills, so we got to spend lots of quality time with them, but we never got to see or meet their master. Of course, Odin doesn't always ride with them. Many of the stories have other Norse deities or even regional psychopomps leading the hunt. But I think Odin was in Beacon Hills due to this scene from Season 6. Here we have Douglas, who has usurped control of the riders and is ordering them to kill Scott and his friends. The riders seem ready to obey until Big Sky Daddy speaks up. I think that thunderous command is Odin taking back the reins and doling out punishment to this arrogant Nazi. I am your leader. Ich bin dein Anzera. Obey me! Gehorst mir! Oh yeah, and if you're wondering why Norse ghost riders look like cowboys, it's our fault. Neil Gaiman's wonderful novel, American Gods, speculates on how immigrants to America bring their gods with them, and then the gods change shape and appearance due to the ideas and folklore in this new land. In the case of The Wild Hunt, in 1948, American singer Stan Jones cast The Wild Hunt as cowboys, damned to ride herd forever across the sky, gathering up souls. It's a very popular song with versions released by various singers and charting in the United States in every decade from the 40s through the 80s. So here and now, Odin's Wild Hunt appears as a bunch of cowboys. Dogs and death have been associated in human culture since before we had words to describe either humans or culture. Spirit dogs have heralded death or guarded the underworld in most of the planet's multi-theistic religions and regional folklore. Our Teen Wolf Hellhound was solidly linked with Odin's ghost riding hunt, but admitted that it's also known by names that predate Odin by centuries. Who am I talking to? Cerberus, Garm, Bloodshot. I've had many names. Dogs and death. Death and dogs. The association probably started from something really gross, like the fact that before humans started burying their dead, and even shortly after, canine creatures would often be seen dining out on corpses. Now, I could not find a solid dog-headed deity with the Olmecs or the Sumerians, so I'm starting with Egypt, where they had a whole bunch of jackal gods running around. And every one of them had something to do with death. Set ruled over storms, disorder, violence, and foreigners, all things that brought a lot of death in a world where stranger danger wasn't just catchy propaganda for kids. Anubis was in charge of death, mummification, and lorded over the underworld. Whipwawet was the opener of the ways. Now, he initially was a war god and sort of a mascot to the pharaoh that helped him in battle, but eventually he became associated with death as the guy who opened the way to the afterlife. Finally, Diwa Motef. He's also associated with death, but he has a very specialized job description. He is the head on the jar where they store the stomach during mummification and interment. His one job is to protect the stomach in the afterlife.
Okay, that's about a minute and a half more about Egyptian dog gods than you needed, but I'm building a platform on which our Teen Wolf Hellhound will stand. And the next level of that platform is the Greeks, who had their multi-headed guardian of the underworld, Cerberus. I say multi-headed because while I was always taught he had three heads, many actual ancient Greeks disagreed and give him just two heads. Some say it's 50 or even more than 100 heads, but many of those heads might be snakes, apparently. Uh, uh, I think those ancient Greeks were ingesting some serious consciousness-enhancing substances. Anyway, there's yet another big dog guarding the land of the dead. Then, separated by 12,000 miles and about 3,000 years, the Aztecs came up with Xolotl, the dog-headed god that guided the souls of the dead. You get the idea? Somewhere in the early human psyche, dog and death became inextricably intertwined. And by the time Xolotl was ushering deceased Aztecs to their final seats, Odin's wild hunt had already been riding the storm for hundreds of years, collecting souls along the way with hellhounds at their side. The Norse pantheon also has Garmer, who guarded the afterlife. Almost every culture has a big black dog myth associated with fire, souls, and the afterlife. So when the Teen Wolf Hellhound says he's known by all these different names, he's telling us that the fiery spirit form that came to that battlefield in Afghanistan, the one that took over the life of poor blowed to hell Jordan Parish, our Hellhound, is actually the basis for all the other death dog myths around the world. Overall, the way I prefer to think about the Hellhound thing is that in the Teen Wolf universe, there have always been this group of dog-like spirits that serve some supernatural purpose having to do with death and the afterlife. They have assumed different forms and functions and names as different cultures became aware of them, but they were always the same group of spirits doing what they've always done. The spirit inside Parish and the other spirits like it are eternal. They'll be here long after these myths are forgotten, doing the same thing they always do, helping souls find the afterlife and guarding the doors to keep them there. I should make clear that none of this is canon. It's just my speculation based on the actual canon that we saw during the original run of the show. All the things, the gods, monsters, spirits, all the things are up to Jeff, the writers, and whoever has control of the Teen Wolf intellectual property during the next phase of development. My little videos are just me trying to make sense of the universe and are in no way, shape, or form to be considered canon. I mean, it's fun, but it's not canon, okay? Next up, the most important god in the Teen Wolf universe, the head of the Greek pantheon, Zeus. Long story short, Zeus is the reason we have werewolves. Daddy Thunder got offended by a prank by this total bro-hole who happened to be the king of Arcadia. So the king of the Greek gods fired up his lightning bolts and zapped the bro-hole and all his sons, turning them into 50 wolves. The part that's lesser known is how my king sought out the druids to help turn him back to human. They couldn't make Lycaon and his sons human again, but they did teach them how to shift back and forth. And once they could shapeshift, they became the world's first alpha werewolves. Zeus is one of those cases where I believe there's a strong argument for the fact that he actually exists or existed at one time in the Teen Wolf universe. That whole Zeus Lycaean druid thing is straightforward narrative, explaining a real relationship that still exists between werewolf packs and druids. It's a logical story without the need for genetic mutation or some disease that caused the changes we saw, and then some additional fluff to explain how the druids and the werewolves got hooked up. 
the Zeus thing is an elegant solution to the question of why there are werewolves with supernatural abilities. I kind of lean hard into this option because what fun is the alternative? I mean, if you're going to have a supernatural show, why ground it in boring mutations and genetics? Plus, by season three, Teen Wolf was leaning hard into the whole spirit realm. The Oni, Kitsune, and Nogitsune we saw make it increasingly difficult and convoluted to find some grounded genetic explanation for demon warriors who spring from fireflies and flaming fox spirits with a mind of their own. So yeah, there are obviously real Japanese spirits in the Teen Wolf universe. I mean, they're much changed from their source material, but there's no doubt that they exist. Now, I don't speak Japanese, so I have to rely on sometimes suspect English translations for information. Please, please forgive me if I screw all this up. Oni, on the show, were spirit warriors that could be summoned and set about a task by the summoner. Originally in Japan, the word just referenced the spirits of the dead, but then came to mean a type of troll or monster that was eventually used by parents to scare children. The Kitsune were originally associated with Inari. She was what we would refer to as a god, but the Shinto word is more nuanced. Either way, she was the spiritual force revered by farmers. She represented rice and the harvest. Inari apparently had a retinue of white foxes that served as messengers. But the foxes, the kitsune, then took on all sorts of additional roles within Japanese folklore. There are various flavors and a strong belief in fox possession, which is kind of like what we saw with Kira in season five. It became obvious here in this scene that Kira's fox spirit is separate from her in some ways. It is a spirit entity with a mind all its own. Nishiko also sort of lays out the possession thing when she is dying back in 1943. But I could not die knowing they would get away. So I called out to our ancestors for Kitsunetsuki, possession by a fox spirit, for a powerful Nogitsune, to take control of my weakened body, imbue it with power, and use it as a weapon. She wanted to use the Nogitsune herself for vengeance, but it had other plans. Nogitsune really just means wild fox. Its behavior on the show is an amalgam of all the trickster aspects in all the fox legends. So Noshiko got way more than she asked for, and we got one of the most memorable characters ever on the show. Me? I'm a thousand years old! You can't kill me! I love that guy. I mean, I totally hated that guy, but you, you know what I mean. I'm using a lot of illustrations from an Italian art book called Age of Pantheons. I would love nothing more than to sell you a copy of this book, but it's out of print. The whole thing is available to view online, though, and I've linked you to that. It is absolutely beautiful, and you should definitely check out the whole thing. Next up in the Teen Wolf Pantheon, the one god that makes me think the other gods must be real in this universe. Tezcat... 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 Tezcatlipoca. Yeah, what she said. This hunk of Mesoamerican lore was a total badass who was said to have ruled over the first world known as Jaguar's son. In the present world of the Aztecs, he had returned and defeated a big old feathered serpent, ended a golden age of prosperity, and reintroduced human sacrifice into the culture. Yeah, not a really great guy. The reason I think Tezcat... Tezcatlipoca. Yeah, him. 
The reason I think he actually existed in the Teen Wolf universe is because his temple actually worked. It de-aged a grown man into a teenager and stole the free will of an alpha werewolf with the simple application of an animal skull. That is powerful, godlike mojo. And all the stories suggest that Tetzcatlipoca could assume a humanoid jaguar form, which could explain why his temple worked for Kate when she was also in that form. I don't know if he's still around, but he definitely was at one time and left his wonderful toys behind for Kate to pick up. From Mexico, we move a little further north into the spirit world of North American indigenous populations. Now, here is one of the cases where I consider the creatures and spirits we saw on the show to be wholly separate from and not dependent on any specific gods. From the Native American traditions, we get the Wendigo, which is said to be an evil spirit that endlessly hungers. It takes over a human that has done evil deeds or broken taboos like cannibalism and turns them into a monster. There is an argument to be made within the context of Teen Wolf that the Wendigo started way back in the timeline as a werewolf bite that went wrong in a very specific way that produced a very hungry caterpillar with shark's teeth. But we don't know enough about them really to even speculate. Also for North American tribes, we get the Skinwalkers, and again, we don't really know enough about their Teen Wolf version to speculate too far, and the Navajo who do know the real stories don't like to tell them to non-Navajo. I suppose I'm actually doing a great disservice to the entire culture, rambling on about it, but it was on the show, and it probably shouldn't be ignored. Original mythical Skinwalkers seem to be akin to the Dark Druid we saw in Season 3. In this case, powerful medicine men and women who tipped too far toward evil and used their powers to harm instead of help the tribes. They are portrayed as powerful beings on the show with a command of the elements, an ability to create lifelike illusions, and a full understanding and some control of all things supernatural. You'll stay and become one of us, a skinwalker. You'll walk with us under the sun, through the dust. But again, they don't seem to be related to any specific god group. The same is true of Anukate, which in the real world myth is considered to be a monster with two faces that paralyzes with fear. Old Doubleface isn't a god and not directly related to one that I could find. Now we're getting into a couple of gods that are referenced indirectly on Teen Wolf. In season five, we get Garuda Claws. A werewolf with the talons of an eagle. It's possibly a shapeshifter, known in Eastern mythology as a Garuda. So we know Garuda exists or existed in this universe because Deaton is familiar, and also the Dread Doctors could make a fake creature with Garuda Claws. In the real world, Garuda are birdmen mainly found in Hinduism and Buddhism. I'm literally afraid of screwing this up, so I'm going to stick to the very basic stories on Garuda, which leads us first to the Hindu god Vishnu. When the protector of the universe needed to get around quickly, he rode Garuda. But before becoming a celestial uber, Garuda had his own life and legend. Apparently, his mother asked specifically that he be stronger than her sister wife's 1,000 sons, who also happened to all be snakes for some reason. He had a prematurely hatched brother who drove the chariot of the sun, and at some point Garuda waged war to save his mother from slavery. Yes, I know it's all a lot more complicated than that, but I'm just one guy with an American liberal arts education, a wonky internet connection, and limited time. I do know that the Buddhists have a much more interesting background on Garuda. It's not just one guy. It's a whole species of supernatural creatures. They have their own society, royalty, the whole shebang. In these stories, they're the sworn enemies of the snakes. 
it's unclear which Garuda we're dealing with in Teen Wolf. Like I said, the latter story is far more interesting, but I also like to think that Vishnu is out there too, keeping the universe glued together while Shiva picks it apart. The next God reference is difficult because it's just so old and the stories have been warped and twisted through the ages and even in modern times by, of all things, Dungeons and Dragons. I'm talking about the Scorpion Man Scott mentioned in Season 5. The kid turning into a half-scorpion, half-werewolf. Is it even a myth for that? Sumerian. I wonder something about it in the beast year. Now, the thing he's talking about is most likely from the story of Gilgamesh, where scorpion men are the guards at the sun god's palace. But if you dig deep enough into their origins, you find the god Tiamat. And here's why digging into her and finding a proper representation is difficult. Dungeons and Dragons used the name for a multi-headed dragon way back in 1975. And since then, everybody decided it was a cool name for a planet or a video game boss or a weapon or whatever. As best I can tell, Tiamat was one of the original creator gods in what we now consider the Middle East. She represented the sea and married the god of fresh water, and they made lots of little gods who eventually turned on them and killed their father. Well, Tiamat was pissed and created monsters to fight for her in the God War. Among those were the Scorpion Men. Now here's the problem with figuring out if Tiamat actually existed in the Teen Wolf universe. The Dread Doctors did use supernatural ingredients in making their Chimera. We know they used mostly werewolf, but as I mentioned, those were some really good Garuda Claws they made, so they had some mojo along with their fakery. But they also used just regular animals, like Josh was werewolf mixed with electric eel. So was Spiky Guy here just mixed with regular scorpion? I mean, Scott brought up Samaria before they actually knew they were dealing with fakes. I don't know. Either way, Tiamat is cool, and it would be badass if she was real. 